Hello, I'm Eric Sorensen, and this is the West Block, Politics, Perspectives, and Players. They are historic proceedings. The impeachment trial of President Donald Trump is now underway in the U.S. Senate. Will Republicans abandon the president? Will there be witnesses? The world is watching. The whirlwind around Trump has overshadowed the Democratic Party's search for a nominee, but the primaries are about to begin, where candidates can catch fire or flame out. Former Democratic presidential candidate Howard Dean knows all about that, and today he's going to size up the Democrats and Donald Trump at a time that is a test for both political parties. Um, Howard Dean, thanks for joining us. The Republicans want this trial in the Senate to go away quickly. Can they bring this to, to an early vote and be done with it? They could, but they'll pay a huge price at the polls. There's five or six Republican senators from swing states that are in some jeopardy, and covering up misdeeds of the president is probably not a great way to get reelected in places like Maine. So it's going to be quite interesting. I think McConnell's probably going to lose some control of his caucus, which hasn't happened before, because there's nothing that's more motivating than, than an election that you may not be doing well in. So is it kind of a lose-lose for, for the president then? Because if they end it early, you think it will be a loss. But surely if this carries on for some time, that can't help the president either. No, I think if it carries on, it hurts the president. And, and so far, the president's been incredibly effective in bending the Republicans to, their, to his will. But there's nothing more stimulating than losing your own election. Uh, the president can cause that with many of these senators, uh, and that's why they're so obedient to him. But in this case, uh, a bad vote or a, a whitewash or a cover-up by the entire leadership of the United States Senate is not likely to enhance their candidacies in the swing districts. His, uh, his approval and disapproval numbers never seem to budge much. Do you see them budging from this? No. Um, I, you know, I think it's really a matter of motivation than anything else. If we get our vote, our voters are young, under 35. They vote 70 percent for the Democrats. Uh, of color, uh, the vast majority of uh, Asian Americans, African Americans, and Hispanics vote for the Democrats because of Trump's immigration behavior and so forth, uh, and women. If we get them to the polls, we're going to win. If we don't get them to the polls, that's we're going to lose, plain and simple. There's not much swing back and forth. It's who comes to the polls. Uh, would it be a mistake to underestimate Trump's uh, potential to uh, win re-election? No, I think it's a 50-50 jump ball right now. I don't, I mean, he is despised by half of America, but the other, you know, he's got 40 percent that is essentially our cult members. And they're not going to go anywhere. No, he, 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 was, he was truthful, which is one of the rare times when he said, I could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and my people would still vote for me. That's true. So I want to swing over to the Democratic race now. About a year ago, you called, it's, as I recall, for a newer, younger candidate, a generational shift. And, and in this last year, just about all the younger candidates, the more diverse candidates, have dropped off. Is that, is that ultimately, is that... How do you see that playing out? Is that playing out in a good way or a bad way for the Democrats? Well, it, it's a, it, we've done pretty well. In the last three elections, 17, 18, and 19, all by-elections is what you would call them, uh, except for the 18 congressional elections, our membership in the House and the state houses and state legislatures have bec has become much younger. Uh, much more female and much more of color. So uh, the revolution is underway in the Democratic Party. It's about a third completed. Whether we can do the presidency or not, um, you know, if it is somebody in their 70s and they win, they'll be a transitional figure. Uh, and if it's not somebody, if it's a younger person, they, they may not be. But the, 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 the good news is we're having a peaceful revolution in the Democratic Party. It's not so peaceful over on the Republican side. Now, we saw you a, a little bit earlier, 2004. You were the outsider. You ran against John Kerry. He won the nomination but lost to George W. Bush. Do you see any parallels between sort of how you were viewed back then and that you were sort of maybe more of the outsider and then they went with Kerry and lost anyway? And is there a potential for that this time? Sure. I mean, that's what we, we know. Nobody knows who the best candidate to beat Trump is. Obviously, every candidate is claiming that they have, a, have an opportunity to do that. You know, the race is not exactly the same. As I look back on it, I was really running against the Democratic Party, uh, even though I went on to be the Democratic chairman. I suppose that was the first re recent revolution in, uh, in the party. Everybody else, had, all the major candidates but me, had voted for the war. They had voted for Bush's tax cuts. I was against those things. Um, 
And so, uh, but you know, the, the, but they, in the end, the Iowa voters went with somebody they considered to be a safer candidate, which turned out not to be the case. But you don't know that until you get in the race. And that's why I like having these four states, four, four smaller states earlier, so voters can really try to judge them on a, on a personal level and a personal basis. There are, it looks like about six candidates now that uh, have the best chance of winning. There's Biden, Sanders, and Warren, kind of in the top tier, perhaps. Uh, Bloomberg, Buttigieg, um, and Klobuchar uh, co coming in behind that. Can you handicap that at all? Uh, just for what it is, uh, you know, just as you know, I was leading with 23 days to go before Iowa, and I didn't end up winning because John Kerry just beat me in the field, and some of our organizational weaknesses and my personal failings as a candidate led us to defeat. Um, so anything could happen. Anything can happen. Uh, right now, I, uh, Biden and Bernie Sanders are leading in Iowa, although not by much. And I think your analysis is probably right. Any of those four, can well, the four top candidates would be Buttigieg, Biden, Sanders, and Warren in Iowa. Uh, but that could easily change. And it is quite possible for Klobuchar to come from behind. Uh, Bloomberg is not on the ballot or, uh, because he didn't uh, file. He, did, he got in late. It's Tom Steyer or some of the other candidates. Michael Bennett is still in the race. He's a very interesting candidate. But it's more, most likely that one of the people on the debate stage is going to come out of Iowa with a win. Well, uh, Howard Dean, I know you have to be a little bit neutral because of your role with the party right now, but uh, really thank you for your insight uh, as we head into these last 10 months before the election. Thank you. Thanks very much, and thank you for the opportunity to re let me remind Canadians that we actually do really like you. And when we have a normal president, we'll be right back working with you, and we're looking forward to it. All right, Howard Dean, thanks. That's all for the West Block this week. Thanks for listening.